Okay, thanks, Kai. So, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, um, the first part was really focused on uh, building prediction models, but I told you there is uh, much more than you can do than building prediction models, and that's uh, what the second part is about. So, uh, this summer school is wonderfully organized because I'm really going to use what Fiona uh, taught you yesterday. Uh, so he's made my life so much easier. Um, and he, you know, he bashed about online advertising and he talked about health, but then he complained about the fact that he couldn't run counterfactuals. When one of the reasons I'm in advertising is that you can run counterfactuals, and that makes life much more fun. Before I start on this second part, I just want to come back on two, uh, the last two questions um, that were yesterday, uh, because I want really to re-emphasize a point. Uh, the first one is that uh, really when you try to build a model, start simple. Uh, what I've presented you yesterday may not be the most advanced models that you're going to use, but to me they are the best compromise between um, accuracy and simplicity. And way too often I see people saying, I want to solve this problem, I'm going to start training a neural network. Uh, there are many simpler models than neural networks, and once you reach these limits, uh, you can try building more complex models. And so one of the questions was about um, gradient boosted decision trees, saying why do we want to do just complex models rather than just bucketize them in the same way. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to reiterate this answer is that yes, you should at first bucketize all of them the same way and then move forward. So really, in general, start simple. You'll be impressed as how well simple things work. Okay, so I will start this part where I left off yesterday, which is you've devoted a lot of effort to building a good prediction model. And now is the time to test your prediction model in real life. Okay. So for this, uh, you're going to run an A-B test, so I'm assuming almost all of you are familiar with A-B testing, but just a quick um, recap. You want to compare, in that particular case, two systems, uh, the current production system with your new system. And so it's really a two-arm bended problem. One arm is the, um, the production system, the other arm is the system you want to test. And what you're going to do is you're going to split your population in two. Uh, that's actually easy in some cases, hard in others. So for instance, if uh, your data is on the graph, so your Facebook, how do you split your population into two uh, given that uh, maybe you want friends to be in the same population and everything, so that's a complex problem. I'm not going to go uh, into this, mostly because I don't know how to solve that problem because I've never been faced with it. So here I'm assuming you're going to split your model into two for some period of time, maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months, and uh, at the end of this time, you're going to choose the model with the uh, best average reward. Okay? So, uh, I will, yeah, so, the, uh, so what you do is first you check the average value, but then you also want to know how well you can trust this average value. So maybe you're going to check the confidence intervals around these average values, and you're going to make sure that, let's say, zero is outside of the confidence intervals, okay? So you can be confident that uh, the improvement is statistically significant, and when you see papers, you see this, they, uh, Hopefully they do that, some of them don't, they shouldn't. Um, so you have an average value and then you build confidence intervals and you see if it's statistically significant. Now two questions uh, I, I'm going to ask that I'm not going to answer right now. Uh, and actually I'm not going to even mention it right now. So you run your A-B test and your results looks like this. Okay? These are, this is data from an actual A-B test we ran at Creo. So on the x-axis, so we run that A-B test for a bunch of clients, a bunch of advertisers. On the x-axis, you have the improvements in the RMSE, which was our error metric to predict the click probability. I've removed the labels, uh, but zero is somewhere in the middle of that time. And on the y-axis, you have the increase in revenue for that particular client. Okay? And as you can see, they are fairly poorly correlated. Okay, so you've built, you've spent effort building a prediction model to minimize some error metric. In that case, let's say it was the RMSE, so the root mean squared error. 
Um, and then you A-B test the result, and you see that minimizing this RMC did not guarantee that you would actually increase the revenue. So maybe all the effort you spent improving the prediction model was done for nothing. So yesterday, Jonas asked me the questions, and I thought that was great. So why do you think that is? So my theory tells me that if I run a second price auction, uh, the optimal strategy, the optimal bid is the how much I'm being paid per click times the probability of click. So I'm improving that probability of click, and yet my production system performs worse. So that, these are questions you're actually going to be faced with. So, yep. Population has changed. So the population has changed. Yes, that is a very good answer. That's one of uh, at least three factors. So in that particular case, um, and that's, that's actually going to be most of, of, of this part. Um, in that particular case, as I told you yesterday, Creo participates in 20 billion auctions per day, and we display 3 billion ads. So usually when we say we display 3 billion ads, we want people to say, ooh, that's a lot. But in reality, that's only 15% of the auctions we participate in. And when you try to estimate the probability of click, obviously that probability can only be estimated on the auctions you want, because you won't have done something to observe the click. So our model was only trained on 50% of the auctions we participate in, and yet we test it on 100% of the auctions. Okay? So that's one major impact, is that that distribution has changed. Any other one? Yeah. There's a disconnect between clickers and purchases, where like revenue is correlated with purchases. But so that's that. That is a good answer. Uh, so the answer is uh, we've improved our probability of uh, click-through rate, but uh, the revenue depends on on purchases. Uh, in that particular case, actually, the revenue is based on what we improved on. So that revenue is based on clicks, and we improved on the uh, click-through rate. But that definitely could have been a possibility. Any other one? OK. So one, uh, which is the uh, one of the one people uh, think about usually first, is the noise. Maybe I just didn't run my A-B test for long enough. Or maybe I trained my model not for long enough. Yes? You are now fully confident in feeling on options so it's so okay. So uh, the, the the answer was uh, we're overconfident and we're bidding on the auctions we shouldn't be bidding on. So first, just a, a quick detail: we should bid on every auction, but maybe it's on some of them very low. Uh, and that comes back to uh, to the previous answer, which was uh, well, we're just bidding wrongly on all on on these auctions, and that wasn't detected in our RMSC because these auctions weren't appearing in our training set. So really, the fact that we bid wrongly is a consequence of the changing distribution. OK, so the second one is noise. Uh, again, maybe either our, uh, our test set uh, was not big enough, and so even though we improved the RMSC on the test set, that wasn't good. Or maybe the AV test uh, didn't run for longer. OK, so that's the second one. And there's the third one, uh, which people don't think of, and I think it's the most important. I told you that these auctions were second price auctions and that the optimal bid was the cost per click times the CPR. No one checks that. And that's actually not true. So that's what we say. In many cases, first, second, uh, these are not all second price auctions. Then, in some cases, even if there were second price auctions, the optimal bid would not be cost per click times CTR. And that's another point uh, on which I want to spend time, because really, we've made a bunch of assumptions. And within these assumptions, we've improved the model. And then at some point, you really need to rethink your assumptions, because any improvement you can make to the model is going to be marginal if you make the wrong assumptions. And so you constantly need to challenge these assumptions. And they were nice, because they allowed you, again, to cast this complicated problem of 
of how much do I need to bet into a simple problem, which is I just need to estimate the probability effect. But maybe that's not the case. Okay. So about noise. Um, that's really uh, recent, recent thoughts. So all of this is basically at the edge of what I understand, this and her uh, presentation. So, but it's a lot of open problems which I think we should focus on. Uh, so I said you need to compute the, um, the average difference between the current production system and the, um, and, the new, and the new system. And you hope that zero, you're going to compute the confidence interval, and you hope that zero is outside of the confidence interval. That's actually, that's pretty much what everyone, as far as I know, does. That's not a great strategy. Mostly because at some point you're going to have improvements which are just quite tiny. Okay? If you improve your system by 0.01%, actually it doesn't really matter whether you put A or B, unless you Google and 0.01% because that's dumb. And, but yet, if it's 0.01%, you're going to wait for a very long time for zero to be outside of the confidence interval. So you can have an A-B test run for very long for something that truly does not matter at all. Okay? So, um, maybe waiting for zero to be outside of the confidence interval should be impacted by how much do you expect from this A-B test. Another thing is that uh, we mentioned adding features. When you add features, you add features over and over for months, for years. At some point, maybe you have some prior knowledge about what these features should bring. Okay? Maybe these features should bring value unless there's a bug. But you have enough data to estimate the probability that there might be a bug in your system. So suddenly, Rather than take uh, this an A-B test from scratch and assume nothing, maybe you could assume some prior distribution on what is this A-B test going to run. Then you gather data, you get a posterior distribution on what is the impact, the impact of the A-B test. Uh, and at the end, you can make a decision. Because the whole point of an A-B test is not to evaluate how much it brings, it's just to make a decision. And at every point in time, you have three decisions you can make. You roll out B, you roll back to the current system, or you wait together. You wait longer to gather more data. And if you have a proper distribution of what this A/B test can bring, that allows you to make these decisions. If you don't do that, you end up with some rules like every A/B test is going to run for a week, or every A/B test is going to run for two weeks. And what's going to happen is that some A/B tests are going to run for much longer than what they should, and some A/B tests are going to run for shorter than what they should. Okay. And so you might end up with noise. So again, that's not a complete solution. That's just one slide. But I think right now we've been wasteful in the way we handle A-B tests. And we should, I mean, testing something on real traffic takes up a lot of resources. And the whole first part of my talk was how to be resource efficient. And we need to be resource efficient for A-B tests as well. We need to find a way to run shorter A-B tests when we can to have longer A-B tests when we need Okay. So, the other two points. Uh, the first point is that uh, the input distribution is the same. And the second point is that, yeah. About the A-B tests, um, in statistics there is this optimal stopping theory that goes back to Val. That can it play a role by making decisions sequentially about how we want to stop experimentation. So I'd be blunt with this. I'm not familiar with the uh, with this theory. So, uh, well, it's a very very old test that was developed after the Second World War, but when to stop terminating the collection of data, and I mean it's a very elaborate thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so it's basically it's okay. Then the, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not a yeah. So this is something I I haven't heard of. So maybe that's that's something worth looking into. And how it relates to also what I what I just mentioned, uh, because I'm assuming it probably shares uh, some of the same ideas. So um, yeah, so the first one is is the uh, the first implicit assumption is that the input distribution is the same, and really that's an assumption we make all the time when we compute test error. When you say my algorithm has an error rate of 5%. It means my algorithm has an error rate of 5% under the test distribution I was given. Okay? 
And you have to be extremely careful about what that means. In particular, if you, you know, if you, if you sell your system to, to others, what can you say to them? And what can you say about the change in distribution? And so this is a, okay, uh, that's synthetic data, but let's assume this is pretty much the, you know, the size of our clients. You're going to have a few very big clients and a whole of small clients. And if you look at the average error rate, these account for not that much. So what we'll do when we'll minimize any average metric is we'll uh, focus on these big ones. Okay? And so let's assume that that's the limit under which you can't really uh, say anything. And so we'll do some good job on the, on the blue one and some poor job on the orange one. Now let's assume, for instance, that you get twice as much data. Well, if you get twice as much data, the curve looks exactly the same, but you just have a lot of, whole lot more blue ones. If you check the average error, that doesn't change anything. Because these ones still dominate, and these ones, they already had enough data uh, for you to learn well. So, if someone asks you, oh, we're subsampling the data, should we reduce that subsampling rates? You're going to say, in terms of average error, that doesn't make any difference. So, you know, just discarded data is useless. What you lose by computing the average error is that suddenly you do better on these ones. And if these ones were to grow bigger for different reasons, uh, it might be because you change your strategy as we do, or it might be for some other reasons, then this is important. So a, the metrics we use do not capture what happens when you change the distribution. So that's something we have to be extremely careful about. In all cases, because the external distribution might change over time. Uh, some clients might appear, some clients might disappear. But even more so in our case or in similar cases, where we do have an impact on the distribution. Because the, what we see depends on our current bidding system. Okay. So to give you an idea, that's a paper from 2011 called An Unbiased Look at Dataset Bias. Uh, and it's, okay, before you look at the numbers, um, it was re-mentioned to me recently when people say, for instance, you know, image recognition is solved, or digit recognition is solved. We do 0.23% error rate on MNIST. Uh, that's, you know, below human rate, that, that's fine. Or when you see these headlines saying, oh, we make that much error on ImageNet, uh, and that's, again, lower than human error, we've solved this. So they, what they've done is they have trained an image recognition model on one data set, and they have tested it on another data set. Okay? But they've normalized the data set to be fair, so the images have roughly the same size. Uh, they show roughly the same thing, but not exactly. And so, on the, on the rows, you have the data set they trained it on. On the columns, you have the data set they tested it on. And that's for the car classification problem. And so, for instance, if you see Caltech 101, so if you train on Caltech 101 and you test on Caltech, Caltech 101, you get 97% accuracy on the car classification. That's ex excellent. If you train on Caltech 101 and you test on, let's say, label, you can give it up to 31%. On the other way, to go down to 42 percent. And if I don't have these here, uh, but they are in the paper, if you look at the images from these different data sets, it's extremely hard to tell them apart. So for any human, you would expect that that your performance on every single data set is roughly the same. Okay? For algorithms, it's really not. So that's something we have to be extremely aware of. Um, so Leo Boutou mentioned this last year at at ACML, and he talked about the definition of a contract. Okay. What kind of contracts do machine learning algorithms fill? What can we actually say? And that's something that uh, bit Microsoft recently with the, uh, with the vote they had. That, well, the contract was, under their training distribution, it does something sensible. What happens when you face it to another distribution, which is completely uncontrolled? 
And our current algorithms and our current error metrics do not F, uh, offer that kind of guarantees. Okay? And so if we go back to Creo example, the RMSC was if you show me the exact displays under the exact same distribution, I can guarantee you that on average you're going to make that error. But if you change the distribution, I can't say anything. Okay, and that's something we have to be extremely aware of. So, the other one. So, that's something you've um, seen yesterday, but I'm going to re mention it in a slightly different context. Yes? So, this is simply overfilling for the test set, or is there something more fundamental happening? Well, so the question is, is this overfitting to the test sets? Uh, there might be some of it. Uh, if you look at MNIST, for instance, the test set is so simple compared to how long we tried things on that it's definitely overfitting on the test set. Um, I'm not so sure about these data sets because they, they haven't been as overused. And again, in the, in the context of Creo, that's definitely not because that test set was seen, you know, was used only no, maybe not once, but at least only a few times. So that might be a factor. I don't think that's the biggest factor. Okay, so that's what you've seen yesterday. Um, maybe you've seen that before, but I really want to emphasize how damaging Simpson's paradox can be when you build a system. So. As mentioned, uh, let's say you have two positions where you can put your ads. You can put your ad in the top banner and you can put your ad in the side banner. And Jonas mentioned yesterday that when he was working with Microsoft, uh, the top banner will be better. And in your system, let's say you have no variable. The same thing applies when you have many variables, but we'll assume you have no variables. And so that's what you see. Okay. So you see that the average click-through rate on the top banner is 0.67%, and the average click-through rate on the side banner is 0.71%. And so now you're going to improve your prediction model to match these numbers more accurately. And so if you do this, and you build a great prediction model, which does that perfectly, then that prediction model will exactly tell you you should bid more for the side banner than for the top banner. Okay? That's what it says. But if you condition on, let's say, was that user a new client of, I mentioned Walmart yesterday, was that uh, user a new client of Walmart or was that uh, user an existing client of Walmart? And we know that existing clients have more value because they're more likely to click on the ads and to buy something. And so when you have an existing client, everyone's going to compete for the top banner. And so you're much more likely to only get the side banner. So you see, for existing clients, you only have a thousand users for which you got the top banner, and you have six thousand for which you got the side banner. Because the competition was fierce, and so you lost the bets on the top banner. Whereas for the new clients, well, almost all of them were the top banners. Okay, so that's exactly the same thing as what Jonas presented yesterday. But now you see that improving that system, unless you have that variable in your system, is going to be detrimental. Okay? And as Jonas mentioned, that's called a uh, confounding variable. So what can you do uh, when you do have that, and you do have that? Well, the first one is you can add as many ver possible variables uh, in a model as you can. And that's what people who can't run many experiments do, or that's what economists do because they can't just replay uh, the world. So they say, we accounted for this factor and that factor and that factor, and we've, we're kind of hopeful that we've eliminated all confounding variables and that the remaining effect is a proper one. Another one is you can explore. Maybe you had the wrong um, estimates because you didn't check enough time for enough users uh, what happens on the uh, on the other, like on the side banner or on the top banner. I'll show that that does not solve the problem. And the third one is uh, you can just run online A-B tests. So you can just be, you know, uh, accept fate. 
and say that is something I can't observe uh, offline. I'm doomed, so I'm just try everything running online A/B tests. That's an okay strategy. The problem is your A/B tests need enough data to reach uh, statistical significance. Bigger companies don't need as much data. That means they will run shorter A/B tests to get that that same result. This means they will innovate faster than you. So if you need online A/B tests, your pace of improvements is definitely going to slow down compared to bigger companies. So you can that that is not sustainable. So uh, the last one is to perform counterfactual analysis, and that's what I focus on uh, for the. Uh, for the rest. Exploration. I have a demo. Perfect. I also need to share my screen. So in this demo, I have uh, generated two types of users. Okay? Low value users and high value users. Okay. On the here, you can see the uh, my highest competitor. What will its bid be? Okay. So you remember, it's an auction. Everyone bids for the right to display an ad. And my competitors are good. They can differentiate between low value users and high value users, and I can't. Okay. That happens. Uh, they might have uh, more meaningful variables. And so they did lower for low value users than for high value users. Okay? Uh, and there's also, in that particular case, but that really doesn't change the results, there's a higher value of low, low, volume, uh, low value users. Okay? So if I check the click through rate of these users, it's definitely not as big as the click through rate of these users. Okay? And my competitors can all bid differently, I can only bid the same for everyone. So I've computed So if you go back, I'm going to show them side by side. Well, let's do that. <coughs> so on the right hand side, okay, for every let's assume I'm always bidding the same thing. If I'm bidding here, I'm only going to, see, if I, my bid is here at about 0 0.4, I'm only going to see low value users. Okay? And so if I compute the CTR of the ones I see, it's pretty much going to be exclusively the CTR of low value users. Okay? And so that's exactly what it shows here. That's the average CTR I observe. Okay? And here it's 0 0.4. And when I start bidding higher, I'm going to start to include high value users as well. And so the CTR I observe, on average, will start to get bigger. Okay? And you see it gets bigger up to about 0 0.48. Okay? So this right hand side shows you just what is the average CTR observed as a function of my bid. Now, obviously, now, what I, what I want is not to have the higher CTR, it's to make the most money. So I want to pay less than what I earn. Okay? So when you start to bid super high, you do get a high CTR on average, but you also pay a lot for some users. And so the total gain is here. And so that's the total gain for every single bid value. So if I bid very low, I just don't see anyone, my total gain is zero. Then I start earning money because I get these low value users without paying too much for them. And then I start losing money because I start uh, still getting low value users but paying a lot of money for them because I'm about here. And now I still make more money because I start getting high value users and pay a good amount for them. And then I lose money again because I get high value users but I pay too much for them. Okay? So that is the shape of how much money I earn based on how much I need to bid when I get these users. Okay? And of course, my goal is to be here. And so to bid around, I don't know, it's, I think it's 2.5 something. Make sense? Okay. 
So, all I need to do, so what I do, okay, what do if I, let's assume I'm not smart, and I don't explore. So what I do, I start by bidding randomly, and when I bid randomly, I observe some click through rate. And someone told me your optimal bid is the click through rate, times the cost per click, which means it's one click. Okay? So I start from a random bid, I observe the average click through rate of the users I want. I say, oh, that's my optimal bid. So that's my, I start bidding this new value, and then I see another click through rate because now I get different users, and that's my new value, and I just iterate until my algorithm converges. Okay? And what I show is the gain of this scheme compared to the optimal bid. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Try to get embedded. And so, I've actually done two things. You see random and best. Random, I, my first bid was random. I said, I have no idea what my users are like. I'm gonna randomly bid, and then I'm gonna do this iterative procedure. And you can see, that's the blue line, in the end, my gain is about 260 less than the optimal, than the optimal bid. Oh, sorry. Best is more worrying. My first bid was the optimal bid. It was the one yielding the most money. And if you start from the optimal bid, you compute the average click-through rate of the users you see and say, that's my new bid, it's worse than where you started. Okay? So this strategy not only does not converge to the optimum, it also moves away from the optimum. Okay? And so, again, usually the answer to that is, well, you just need exploration. And the whole point, I can put 20% exploration. And the whole point is that doesn't solve the problem. No matter how much exploration I put, this algorithm does not converge to the optimal value. Okay. I have not yet uh, fully understand what happens. Uh, what I know is that the bandit literature, when you see, so in the multi arm bandit it's obvious, but also in the contextual bandits, they always make the assumption. So, you know, in the contextual bandit literature, they assume that you get some state, which you call x, and then you try to learn the parameter theta such that the, the reward is, uh, let's say, a function of theta and x. They always make the assumption that you can actually learn the true reward with this model. That is, they always make the assumption that the model is well specified. We have no guarantee of what the bandits do when the model is ill specified. And here, that's exactly this. It's not well specified. I'm missing a variable, which is the quality of the users. So if I rerun the exact same algorithm and I put uh, with a contextual bandit and I put as input variable, is this a high value user or a low value user? I will find the optimal strategy that's absolutely fine. But if I don't put it, I move away from the optimal strategy. And in real life, you're always missing variables. So exploration does not solve the problem. So what does? Again, um, you must mention this. So counterfactual analysis. What would have happened if we had taken another decision? And that's really the question that matters. I made this particular bit. Now, my new system told me I should have made that other bit. Can I predict what would have happened? Okay. So you are going to, as you mentioned, intervene in your system and say, instead of taking this action, I'm going to take this other action. And the rest of the causal graphs, so here that's a very small causal graph, so you have the state of the user, uh, which affects not only the action you're going to take, uh, because based on the variables you know, but also the, the reward, okay? 
And so you're going to intervene in your system and you're going to take another action. So, it's going to be in part uh, a repeat of what Jonas said, but there's some points he did not mention, and, uh, which is actually quite an important point in practice. So you want to choose, let's say, the, the color of the banner, and you have to choose between, you know, the three colors. And so, what do you do? So you can run an A-B test with each color, but if I go from three colors to, let's say, a thousand colors, then that becomes complicated. So, I'm going to do the same thing. Let's say you have two dice, okay, that's a toy example, and that's a similar example. You have one die which falls 10% of the time on the first pass, 85% on the second one, and 5% on the third one. And the second die falls 0.9% on the first one, 0.05 on the second one, 0.05 on the third one. So it's really the, uh, the stochastic version of uh, treatment A, treatment B from, from yesterday. And every time we roll a die, we receive one year. Now the major difference with what was mentioned yesterday is that now you don't know the reward. Okay? So yesterday when you mentioned treatment A and treatment B, you had the success rates for all these treatments for small stones and big stones. Here, I don't know what the success rate is. I can only estimate it okay? by doing repeated flat. And so the question is, can I estimate the performance of my die D1 using the die D0? So, on average, D0, 11.1 years, and that's the exact same competition uh, we had as an exercise yesterday. Uh, and the average gain for D1, you just take the gain for each facet and you multiply by the probability of having these facets. It's higher, it's 25.5 years. Okay? So, that's exactly yesterday's slide. I can now, even though I have never used uh, die D1, just because it shares the same facet as the die D0, I can estimate on average how much money I will make rolling the die D1. <laughs> now, uh, there's, so if you, yeah, that's just, that's pretty much the same thing. Now, the issue is that, uh, I'm sorry, there's something interesting going on. Okay. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. So now you. So on average, if we go back. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, that is completely normal now. The average gain of the die D zero. I'm sorry. Got a bit lost. The average gain of die D zero is 11.1 year, and the average gain of die D one is 20.5. Now I'm instead of computing the average, I am actually going to roll the die, D0. And so, um, I rolled the die F1 nine times, okay, and I got two euros, okay, and which is pretty much in accordance with the expected gain, which is 0 0.22 euros. Uh, uh, the die F2, since it's 85% uh, of the time, I actually got 87 of it, and I got eight euros. And the this third facet, it has 5%, so on average it have been 5 times, here it's only 4 times, that's reasonable, and I got 1 year. So on average, if I roll my die D0 100 times, I got 11 year as a reward, which is not far from the average, which was 11.1 year. And now what we'll do, I will redo the exact same competition as before, so uh, this one, the one that was showed, but I will use the uh, observed rewards rather than the average rewards, okay? And what happens is that I get 21.5 years. So I, if I, in this particular case, if I get nine occurrences of the first pass at 87 and four, my estimate of how much D1, how much money D1 will bring is actually on average how much money D1 will bring. So I had a very good estimate of the value of D1. So now remember these gains, two, eight, and one, Now, let's assume that, for some reason, you see, this facet brought me one euro. That was the first example. Now, I got two euros, okay? I get a random reward out of these four throws, and the first time only, got, only one of them got me a reward, now two of them got me a reward. That happens, that's life. 
So D0, I was getting 11 euros, now I'm getting 12. And now D1, if I do the same competition, I get 22.75. And the true one is 21.5. So I'm not too far off, that is fine, okay? I got, instead of if you change one euro by two euro, you still get reasonably good estimates. Now, bigger issue, here. On average, I was getting two euros out of nine occurrences. Now I'm only getting one. Okay, again, that happens. D0, I get 10 euros instead of 11. My estimate for D1, 11.6 euros. Again, the truth is 21.5. So my estimate of the true value has just been halved just because this in here, I got one year instead of two. Okay. Can you tell me, can someone tell me what happened? Yes? F1 is a really small part of D0, but it's a big part of D1, so the error is like that. Yes, exactly. So there are two, when we're doing, when we're trying to estimate something, we're doing two things. We are trying to estimate the average value of a facet, and how well we estimate this value is based on how many times we actually are going to have this facet. So here, you can see that the facet 2 is going to be really, really well estimated, because it's through an 85% of the time, and so I'm going to have a really good estimate on average, how much do I win with this. 1 and 3 are only, uh, only occur 10% and 5% of the time. That's not that much. So my estimates of the average rewards of the first and the third facets are not going to be very good. Okay? Now, does that matter? Well, for the third one, it doesn't matter because it also doesn't occur a lot under D1. So I have the poor estimates of my average rewards uh, of the third facet. But it, doesn't, it doesn't account for much in D1 because that facet doesn't also occur. This one is a much bigger issue. It only occurs 10% of the time. So I have a four estimates, but in D1 it occurs 90% of the time. So if I were to actually run D1 on production, the bulk of my revenue would come from this facet. So I really need to estimate how much this facet wins me accurately. And I cannot do that with D0 because D0 does not uh, have this facets occurring enough times. Okay? So when you run counterfactual analysis, so the way I have the mathematical formula somewhere, okay. So the mathematical formula is this one, and I'm using integrals uh, because I'm assuming a continuous set of actions, but you can replace this with a sum uh, going from one, two, three in the case of the die. What you want to know is, the average revenue of your action A, in my case that's a facet, under the distribution of, uh, under the probability of choosing action A. Okay? So Q is the probability of choosing each action under the die D1. And I like to know each action brings me some revenue R, and I like to know the expected revenue under the distribution Q. Okay? That's exactly what I care about. But I do not have access to so you, ideally you would replace this using Monte Carlo estimates, and so you would draw actions from Q and say, I'm going to replace this integral by just an empirical estimate. The problem is, I did not have access to D1. I only had access to D0, which selected the actions in another distribution, P. So what I need to do is, I take this integral, I multiply the second term by P, and I divide it by P, so this integral is the same. And now I have an integral under the distribution P, which is the distribution of actions of my die D0, which I can then replace by a Monte Carlo estimate. Okay? So, uh, did, did, was there a class on important sampling? Yes. Okay. okay. So, really, that's, so that's called uh, important sampling, which is if I want to get estimate from distribution under which I cannot sample, I can sample from another distribution and reweigh this example accordingly. Okay, so really what that tells you is if Q, if AI is chosen much more under Q than under P, then the reward you observe with AI will occur much more under that new distribution. So you want to multiply the reward as observed by a large number. If on the other hand, AI is almost never selected under Q, 
then you don't really care about that word. And so that's going to be selected by a small term. Okay? So that's exactly how you run counterfactual analysis. But then this estimate, on average, is unbiased. But it may have large variance. And the variance depends exactly on the ratio between Q and P. So you come back to the die. If you want to know something and you've almost never taken that action, it's going to be extremely hard to know about this. Okay? So if I want to know the average performance of a blue banner, and my blue banner is only displayed once a day, I have a terrible performance. And so if someone comes to me and say, I want to display my blue banner 3 billion times per day, like, I really have no idea what the, average, what the performance is going to be, because I don't really know what the performance of the blue banner is. Okay? So when do you do counterfactual analysis, you limit it by the distance between how you gather your samples and what you want to test. Okay? And that's actually a major issue. So that's why there is a difference between what was yesterday and yesterday you had the correct estimates. Here, you need to find the estimates. So, uh, the variance can be used. How can we control that variance? There are three uh, main solutions. Uh, there might be others, but these are the simple ones. So, this is my important sampling estimate. So, where the variance comes from? The variance comes, let's imagine there's one action for which P is really small and Q is really large, okay? So Q over P is gonna be really, really big. So in that sum, there's one term that's going to dominate all the others. And that's what introduces variance. So I want to reduce the weight, I don't want every single term, I don't want any term to have a huge impact. So what I do is I will cap this and say the weight of that term can be at most M for some value of M. That introduces a bias, because ideally what it, would have, it should have been was Q over P, and you replace it by M, but that drastically reduces the variance. And whenever you do, that's just a rule of thumb, whenever you do counterfactual analysis, the variance is a much bigger problem than bias. So start by reducing the variance, and then care about the bias. Okay? Um, so now there are some, uh, there are some rules of thumb on how to choose M. Uh, in our particular case, for instance, we basically uh, used past A-B test, computed different values of M, and saw uh, which one was a the best result. So that's capping. Uh, there's another technique, uh, which is quite well known also, uh, that's called normalized important sampling. Okay? So normalized important sampling, you are introducing a term so if you have an infinite number of data, that term is equal to 1. Uh, but if you don't have an infinite number of data, uh, it's different. And in particular, um, if 1 Q over P is really large, that term is going to be smaller than 1. Okay? So it avoids overestimating the impact. Uh, again, normalized important sampling is biased, uh, but it has no variance. Uh, from Discussions I've had with people, I think it's uh, very commonly used uh, as opposed to standard importance of it. There's one last technique uh, which is slightly more advanced, um, which is here, let's assume that how um, to say it. Um, Okay, I'm going to quit advertising for now. Let's assume you run a survey with the next uh, presidential election. And you've divided your population into different categories, maybe men, women, uh, young, old. And you do, because of census data, you do have very good estimates of um, the proportion of each of these categories in the population. Now, let's assume that because, uh, for sampling reasons, uh, your estimate for women is extremely noisy because you didn't have that many women in your, uh, in your sample. If you do this here, so the fact that you have a few women in your sample, that term might be large, and so you're going to change your estimate for everyone in the population. 
even though maybe you had many, many men in your sample and your estimate for the voting of men was really accurate, it was only the one about women that was inaccurate, here you're changing the thing for everyone. And so what you want to do is create independent polls and you're going to adjust for variance in each of these polls independently. And so if some of them has no variance, you're going to use an unbiased estimate. And if some of them have high variance, you're going to use a biased estimate. So that's called stratified sampling, where you contain your variance to each subset of the population. So that is the standard important sampling. And what you do is you're going to create groups J, which are different, and you're going to run normalized important sampling within each group. And so if a group has very large volume, then this is going to be close to 1, and you're going to use the true estimate for that group. If some groups have lower volume, then they will have a biased estimate. But at least you don't impact everyone when you can categorize them. And so there's one question that is, how do you choose these groups? And that's an open question. Okay, are there questions on this? Or anything else? Cool. So when you do that, that's the kind of results you get. So on the x-axis, you have the result of the counterfactual analysis. On the y-axis, you have the true revenue generated by the test. Okay, on um, real AV test of data. So C, it's not, it's not perfect, it's not a straight line. Uh, that actually was mostly done by Anna uh, But it is much more correlated than what we had with our MSC versus Okay, So there is, um, he, it was, it was probably then this morning that Jonas uh, showed the graph also was uh, changing the, um, the reserve for mainline ads at Microsoft. Uh, oh, we had a slide, maybe he went uh, very fast through it. Uh, and in some cases, you can really get very accurate results without having to run the test. And so that's great news. Because now, you do have a reliable offline metric. So now you can try many, many things offline and only run a DB test every once in a while. And so you're not killed by someone who's going to have more data. Another thing is this analysis. Let's assume for now you have stationary distribution. You can, you, you can compute this using two months of data. That's fine. And you don't need to wait two months. You're only limited by computational power. So if you, in our case, for instance, we optimize for sales and we just don't have that many sales, and so an A-B test might take you know, a month. Here, if you have a big enough cluster, you can run this analysis in a few hours or in a few days instead of a month and have very accurate results. Um, counterfactual analysis have limits. Uh, you should be aware of them. Uh, again, with uh, causality, uh, they might be feedback loops. Okay, so in particular, in our case, let's say if the user clicks on the ad, then that's going to change the state of the user, and that's going to change our further bidding strategy. That's really not taken into account into a counter, in a counterfactual analysis. In a counterfactual analysis, we make the assumption that the world around us is constant, and the only thing changing is our action. Okay? When we do change our action, we also do change the world around us. Um, so if you think, for instance, uh, about ads, again, uh, maybe your counterfactual analysis is going to tell you you, th you should display as many ads as possible because that's what's going to maximize your revenue. But so what it doesn't take into account is that if your new system displays close as many ads, you're going to have many, many more people installing ad blockers, and that's going to hurt your revenue. You can't see that because the impact of you displaying more ads does not appear in your log. Okay. So, I really, you really need to make this strong distinction. Counterfactual analysis helps you answer the question, what would have happened if we had taken another decision and everything else had remained constant? It does not answer the question, what will happen after I will start taking another decision? If your distribution is non-stationary, the answer is going to be wrong. And we'll come back to the question of guarantees. It might be okay, but you need to be aware of the assumptions you're making. And here, there's a strong assumption of stationarity. You need to be aware, does, is this assumption okay or not? 
Uh, another comment, uh, in, again, in this uh, bias variance trade-off, what is an action? So I said, you're going to take a different action than the intervening on the action. So you have this variance, and which depends on the ratio, and said AI and AI interaction. So in the die, it was easy. The action was which, which facet. In the real world, it's much more complicated. So in our case, for instance, when a user comes, um, we can display ads for this user for different clients. We can display an ad for Walmart. We can display an ad for, I don't know, you know Nike or something else. And so what we do is we compute the average gain for all of these uh, potential clients, and we choose the best one. So in our case, what's an action? Is an action our estimates for all the clients? Or is it just, let's assume we would have picked the same winner as the production system and changed the bid for that winner. Okay? In practice, of course, when you change your production system, you're going to change your estimates for all of the clients. And so your action is the joint probability of the bids for all of the actions. That has a huge variance. So maybe you only want to do this one. And then again, you make an assumption that the winner does not change. What happens if the winner changes? Uh, there's another big one, uh, which is almost specific to Critio, um, which is recurring actions. So we see a user on average 20 times during the day. And there might be effects when you see the, uh, when you see like ads or if you see twenty ads during the day, you're gonna get bored. Okay, and so maybe an action is not which ad do I display, it's which sequence of twenty ads do I display? Because maybe this has an important effect. And again, if my action is a sequence of twenty ads, my action space becomes huge. The variance of my estimator becomes very large, and I run into problems. So it's all a matter of what kind of assumptions can I make? How do I test these assumptions? What is the impact of making these assumptions? And just like for a prediction model, you want to start simple. Just like here, we started by making the assumption that that was a true second price option. You want to start with the strongest set of assumptions, do what's correct in that set, and then start relaxing the assumptions. OK. There's one last thing I want to mention, um, which is related to reinforcement learning, uh, which is a sub-part of reinforcement learning. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't here for John's lecture, so maybe he mentioned this. That's the formula you've seen about six times so far uh, of important something. Okay? What is the average reward of uh, if I take action Q, but I can only simple according to action Q? And now I'm just going to add something, I'm just going to add a theta, because uh, Q is your um, action model, and it has a bunch of parameters. Okay? So G of theta, which is the average gain you're going to have taking action Q, is this formula. And that's, an action of, that's, a, that's a function of theta. Okay? So what I've just said is, give me a parameter of theta, I can tell you on average how much money you will make if you put this parameter in production. Well, once you have that, the first thing you want to do is optimize over that parameter. Say, I want to find a parameter which is going to yield the maximum revenue. Okay? And intuitively, when I realized that, and that's not me, Definitely not. Uh, that's actually, most of these ideas come from a paper by uh, Leon Boutou and others, and the second one is uh, Jonas. Uh, so most of these ideas come in great part from him. Remember, when you wanted to cast um, your bidding problem as a prediction problem, you had to make a lot of assumptions. Let's assume it's second price, and then what is it? Then uh, it's CPC times CTR, then I'm going to minimize my CTR. But even then, there were at least two things that were bugging me. First, you realize that in an auction, uh, sometimes you're the only one bidding, or you're bidding so much higher than the others that you don't really care whether or not you're really precise. You're going to win the auction anyway. Okay? Whereas sometimes you're super close to the other, and so here, being precise really matters a lot. But any the negative of likelihood, the mean squared error, they don't take this into account. They say, I want to be more precise, but what does precise mean? 
So that was the first thing that was bugging me. And the second one is the one we mentioned about the input distribution. I can learn, I can train a model on some input distribution. If I use that model, it's going to give me another input distribution. Is it still good on a new input distribution? So you have this idea of, in your head, you're going to run some thing to convergence. So I'm going to train a model, get some new data out of that model, train a new model on this new data. What happens if I iterate? Which is pretty much exactly the graph I've shown you of things iterating. And I can't wrap my head around what happens. I get a set of data. What happens if I train a new model, I get new data, I train that new model, new data, I get a new model, and I continue this until convergence. Can I compute the performance I'm going to get after convergence? That seems awfully complicated to me. This offers a very simple answer, if not mathematically, at least conceptually. That is the true performance I will observe a various noise set aside if I put parameter theta in production. That already takes care of all these convergence issues because that deals with the fact that you're going to make actions which are going to change the distribution. So that's exactly what you care about. So you went through the whole process of making assumptions and making wrong things to cast this as a um, prediction, click prediction model, was this is what matters. So I don't care about the rest. And again, that cares, that takes care of if my bid is much higher than the other ones, that takes care of it. My reward will not change if I change this bit in this function. If my bid is really close to the other ones, that's going to take care of it. That's going to change my reward if I change my bid. So that's exactly what you want to do. Now, that doesn't mean you should discard your previous model uh, because First, in our case, for instance, it allowed us to earn money for EKS. Um, so it's definitely something good. And as I mentioned, you do, there is noise into this. So casting this as a simple problem also allows you to reduce the noise. So one of the open problems is how do you merge the two in an efficient way? But so, if you want to optimize this, then that's called policy learning. Uh, and the standard way you do policy learning uh, is, so if you see a lot of paper on this, what they do is they say, well, we start from a theta, that's the original one, we do a small update to our policy, we know it's slightly better, and then we're going to start to gather new samples, uh, because, as I said, the noise depends on how Q and P differ from each other, so we'll gather new samples, and then we'll update our policy again, and then we'll gather new samples. It's okay in some environments, uh, for instance, if you see the Atari games, that's easy because you have a simulator of Atari games and you can run a new game. When you're in a production system, pushing a new model to production can take hours or days. So you don't want to make a small modification to your parameter values and put a new model in production because if you need to do this 40 times in a row, then already a month has passed. Okay? So you need to find ways to do this efficiently. Um, so I'm not going to go into, into the details, but uh, that's the results of an, uh, of an experiment I made. And that's actually, so there is there's no scale. Uh, that's actually uh, the gain you can get offline by optimizing the theta. So you have this nice curve that tells you how do I optimize my revenue. There's something else which is fun, which is a red curve. Again, something which is extremely complicated to do when you have uh, when you cast this as a classification problem. I I want to maximize my revenue, but I don't want to alienate my users. So maybe I want to keep the total number of ads constant. Okay, that's fine. Here, G is an estimate of my average revenue. Okay, under my new model. Let's assume now I change R, and I don't say that's my revenue, I say that's the number of ads displayed. Then G becomes an estimator of the new number of ads I'm going to display. So I have an estimator of any quantity I want under the new distribution. So for instance, what I can do is I can do constraint optimization. I say I can maximize my revenue under the constraints that the number of ads I display does not change. That's valid under that model. You can make anything. And it's, to me, 
there's a really strong similarity between uh, what I said about A-B tests and this. When I mentioned A-B tests, I said, um, how do you distinguish between a change that does not impact much and a change that impacts much? And it forces you to explicit, what do I really care about? How do I take my decisions? And once this is explicit, and that's something Beijing people really love, once you've explicit your prior knowledge about what does that mean, uh, well, I mean, what do I know about my A-B test? Once you've explicit your decision function, everything falls natural. To me, that's the exact same thing. Here, it allows me to explicitly say what quantity do I want to maximize, under which constraint. And so again, conceptually, this is a lot simpler. And so, if uh, to, to, get to, uh, to get to a conclusion, there are two conclusions to me is uh, relax, uh, see what assumptions you're making, and then relax them. And also, uh, the more you change your problem to become a pure machine learning problem, the less likely it is that you're solving the right thing. And so, make sure that you stay as close as possible to what you really care about. And usually, that doesn't take the form of just minimizing a simple classification problem. So again, start simple, start with a classification problem, uh, and Creo has been doing this for a long time, but then you realize you're going to hit a wall. And when you realize that uh, solving the classification problem makes a lot of assumptions that are wrong, then you realize it is obvious that the correct solution is not, I'm going to build a super complex neural network to predict the click-through rate. It is, I'm going to see how I take optimal, how I can make optimal decisions with some uh, assumptions relaxed. And so, the first, pretty much one of the first things I said is still true. I don't think the model matters that much. But the conclusion is usually features matter much. And I think that's incomplete. Features matter much. But also what you're actually optimizing matters a whole lot. So to conclude, prediction performance, that's only one of many problems. That's a simple one. That's the most obvious one. Uh, the one everyone expects you to solve. Um, Solve it, not completely, but at least with the basics. Optimizing the processes, that's absolutely critical. If you can make shorter A-B tests, easier experimentation, it's, it is huge. Uh, then you get suddenly many more people in the company that can start doing something else. And evaluation is a critical problem. Evaluation under maybe another distribution, what does that mean when you get an error rate? And something I haven't touched upon because also that's not solved, which is, let's say you run an A-B test, what are long-term effects? How can you evaluate long-term effects? And we, I think we have too much of a tendency to look where there's light and say, I don't know about this, so I'm going to evaluate and optimize my system on this particular metric, which makes absolutely no sense. And I think there needs to be a strong push to properly evaluate our models, so to really assess what we care about and doing this art. Thanks. Um, so when you do this, you know, flow makes sense. Um, how do you make sure you don't get stuck in the local optimum? So, you know, do you ever just take a random step? Deploy a random step? So, um, so the question is, are we in a, um, in a random minimum? Uh, do we make a random step? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, the short answer is, is we don't know. The slightly longer answer is, we're not in a minimum yet. So right now, my point is really, there are plenty of directions in which we can go uh, to minimize that thing. If we actually truly ever reach a local minimum, then uh, that's, that's something we might care about. But maybe it's like in deep learning, uh, there are just not that many local minima, there's some very flat regions. Um, so I think that comes very late in the life of a company, uh, the, ad the idea that there's a local minimum. Now there's a slight... Um, <clears throat> 
I'm, I'm slightly going to, to change this uh, and come back to a question I made uh, yesterday when I said at Crudio we sometimes sacrifice performance for simplicity. To me it's exactly this. When you have a simple model, uh, you just don't have that many hills to go over. If, if to basically to predict the CTR, we had had a lot of handcrafted rules and a lot of knowledge solely dedicated to click, then we would have reached a local minimum because when moving to sales, we would have had to remove all of this work to start from scratch again. And everyone would have said, I do not accept a decrease in performance, so let's stick to clicks. So forcing you to have uh, modifiable models also allows you to make these changes. Uh, and also in, in bigger companies, uh, so Google <coughs> recently introduced uh, deep learning for the um, search results, as far as I know. Um, that took a while. Because search results is such a big part of uh, Google's revenue, and it's, it's been so nicely tuned that suddenly it becomes very expensive to change. So it's also, I think, our role to make it easy to, uh, to maybe change the system. And uh, again, if you, let's assume you say this, and everyone agrees that that's what you need to maximize, then suddenly you don't necessarily need to move from click to sales anymore. It's only a matter of maximizing this. So if everyone can agree on the end goal, then it's much easier to change the, the subsystem. Whereas if everyone thinks that the important thing is to maximize clicks by minimizing the classification problem, then it becomes more complicated to people change. Just to follow up on the last comment. So for example, if I think about the, like a hedge fund or like a bank, you, you have this view of your loss, you go in the, this very fancy strategy Showing your optimization, even, even some like current results that are very good, you will tell you, well, you need to give me more than that, you need to give me error marks or some like sharp marks or something that is like really totally beyond like prediction, mm -hmm. the point estimate, but also have some form of inference of how much that you are going to do this. Do you, do you, is your, is your impression that in your business or in general that that's also something that is different, maybe between academia and industry? Or like, like I would say, an investor is going to just believe you on your uh, past results, or do you need to take to go a little bit beyond and also do some form of like uh, to produce confidence intervals? Yes, so, uh, so the question is basically about the need to, to produce confidence intervals. Um, I think there are, there are two different answers. Uh, the first one is we're lucky to be in a field where experimenting and failing is not that big of a problem. In the worst case, we just lose money, uh, and that's absolutely fine. If you work for a medical company or something else, you can't really afford this. So our uncertainty, we suffer less from uncertainty about what's actually going to happen uh, than maybe other fields. That being said, yes, we do need to have confidence intervals, uh, because so a major shift is going to raise some issues. and so. Uh, it's important to have some knowledge. Now, it's also really important uh, to understand the limitations of confidence intervals. And again, one of the big things is that here, I'm assuming stationary. So I can completely compute very nice confidence intervals that say, under these conditions, here's what I think will happen. Uh, but I need to be extremely clear that I make no guarantee about what's going to happen if the conditions change. And um, that's something which is, maybe then we need other models about how the world changes, how the advertisers react, um, because there are some things, I think, for which we can't have estimate. Uh, so we can try to have these estimates, but we also, I think, must be honest about what our estimates mean. And if you, if you look at the, um, the result on the Clark classification, they have confidence intervals, and I'm sure these confidence intervals were correct under the distribution of the data. And so, that doesn't invalidate these confidence intervals, that really makes sure that what do they mean. Yeah. Uh, do you think the Vinyasgrass applies to um, return bidding? And if so, do you do anything about it? Do, do you think, do I think what? The Vinyasgrass. Oh, yeah. yes. 
Um, so do I think the Wiener's curse applies to real-time bidding? So Wiener's curse is when you run an auction and everyone, for something which, is the, which has the same value to everyone, on average the winner pays too much. Uh, because the winner had to pay more than the others and since everyone was valuing the thing uh, at the same price, it's usually like for instance the average valuation was pretty much the correct price and so if you won you pay too much. Um, so, I guess we do. I'm not familiar enough to know how, what are the assumptions under which this happens. Um, there is something, though, that you have to keep in mind, which is here we're bidding, but after having won the auction, we're also creating the ad. And one of the things Critter was really good at early on was creating better ads than others. So, you really have two parts of the system. The bidding is evaluating uh, the value of displaying an ad, and then the recommendation system and changing the color and everything is increasing that value. And so really the goal for us is to work on both fronts, because if we can have a higher value than the others, then suddenly we don't need to be as precise anyway, because our value is going to be above. Uh, and so, we know that for instance, for users, who just went on a, on a client's website, the banners tend to look very similar because they almost always tend to display the products that have just been seen and so they might not be that much different. Uh, for users who went on a website a few days ago, then there's much more freedom for doing a good job or a bad job. And so in that particular case, we believe that we're better than uh, the company. Okay, so there are no more questions. Let's sign Nicolas again.